welcome and thank you for joining us in the first session of Grandparenting with Grace. I'm curious, why did you join us in this class on grandparenting? I have a lot of different times over my years of being a grandfather that, you know, if people could somehow attach a meter to us as grandparents and uh, what is our enjoyment level with grandparenting, I, I would guess that most of us would spike the needle, don't you think? <laughs> that I, I don't know that I've ever met a grandparent who didn't enjoy being a grandparent. Um, you know, people even crack jokes and they say, if I would have known that being a grandparent was this much fun, I would have had the grandkids first. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll say things like that. They're communicating to us. Our friends are communicating to us. I love being a grandparent. And so you would spike the needle and so would I on the enjoyment meter. But what if there was a grandparenting understanding meter? where we could somehow measure people's understanding of God's calling on grandparents. What I've discovered over recent years is very few, very few grandparents have received any training from the Bible on grandparenting. From the research I've heard, there are about 30 million professing Christian grandparents in North America. So understand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that there are 30 million grandparents in North America. I'm saying there are 30 million grandparents in America who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ. And if friends of mine that have surveyed some of those, asking how much training have you received from the Bible in the ministry of grandparenting, want to guess what percentage? Say, yes, I've gotten training in biblical grandparenting less than 1%, less than 1%. Now, if you get online and try to track Christian grandparenting, you'll be blessed to find out that there's some headway being made. 20 years ago, there were one or two people writing and speaking on Christian grandparenting. In the last five years, that's multiplied greatly. It's still a small movement, but thankfully, it's a growing movement, that there are more people. I was on a Zoom call yesterday with a group of pastors from across the U.S. who care about biblical grandparenting. They're men my age bracket, grandfathers all, <laughs> pastors all, or retired pastors. And we were on that Zoom call together asking, what could we do? What can we do as grandfathers who are also pastors, pastors who are also grandfathers, what could we do to help train Christian grandparents in the ministry of grandparenting? So it's encouraging that things are happening. Maybe some of you joining us are new grandparents. Maybe you've just recently had the blessing of welcoming your first grandchild, or, or maybe you're even ahead of that and you're anticipating your first grandchild. Well, to those of you joining us who are new to grandparenting, welcome to the wonderful world of grandparenting. <laughs> maybe that's why you're joining us in the Grandparenting with Grace class that you're new to this and you're saying, I want to know what this journey is before I get too far down the road. What is this journey God has laid out for us as grandparents? And yet there are others of you joining us in the Grandparenting with Grace class who have been grandparents for a while. And the Spirit's been doing something in you. He's been stirring up your heart so that you want to know more that you're realizing there's got to be more than grandparenting than what I'm just seeing in our culture. I hope you find your time in this class beneficial. I hope you find it significant in shaping your own understanding of what God says about the ministry of grandparenting. So there's a variety of reasons why you're here joining us in the Grandparenting with Grace class. But why, why am I here? <laughs> I'm Larry McCall, a pastor since 1981 and also the director of Walking Like Jesus Ministries. In 2016, my wife Gladine and I were asked to teach a class here at our home church. We were asked to teach a class on biblical grandparenting. I'll never forget that conversation. When we were asked, would you teach on biblical grandparenting? My first thought was, what? <laughs> I mean, I've been a teacher of God's Word for decades, and I've taught plenty of classes to premarital couples, taught lots of marriage classes, taught multiple parenting classes, but a class on 
grandparenting? Who ever heard of a class on grandparenting? We sure hadn't, even though at that point, we had six very much loved grandchildren. We had never really given it much thought biblically. To ask the question, how does the gospel shape our grandparenting of our then six grandkids? Hadn't given it much thought. And here I was being asked to teach on it. That's been a wonderful journey. <laughs> we said yes to the invitation to teach on that. And since those initial steps in 2016, since those initial steps of going on this journey of grandparenting, my wife Gladine and I have continued to pursue this quest to understand from God's word, what is he calling us to? What is his calling on us grandparents? And this quest that we've been on has been for our own benefit, that we want to be a blessing to our grandchildren, now seven grandchildren, but we also want to help fellow grandparents. We want to help fellow grandparents understand from God's word, what is his calling on us as grandparents? A passage from Psalm 71 that has been gripping my soul since 2016. Verses 17 and 18 of Psalm 71. It reads like this. O oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until, until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Amen. Lord, don't let me depart. Don't let me leave this life without first passing on that baton of the gospel, passing on to the coming generations the glorious truths of God and his grace. Thank you for joining us on this glorious quest. So in this class, what are we going to cover in Grandparenting with Grace? If you look at the table of contents, if you have a copy of Grandparenting with Grace, and you look in the table of contents, you'll see seven chapters, and we're going to spend one session on each chapter. This evening, we're going to talk about what does God want us to know about our grandchildren? Session two will be, my grandchild needs a savior. The third session, here's a topic that we don't want to miss, developing God-honoring relationships with my grandchildren's parents. So as the older generation, we want to focus not only on the youngest generation, the grandkids, but also what's our relationship with the middle generation? What is our relationship with the parents of our grandchildren? We'll spend a session on that. And then one of my favorite topics is the, se the session four, intentional grandparenting. You're going to hear that word intentional a lot over our time together in Grandparenting with Grace, being intentional, that we're not just kind of stumbling through grandparenting, we're not meandering, that there's thought given to it. It's very intentional. Session five is the power of a praying grandparent. I have so much to learn on that. Session six, Gospel grandparenting in today's culture. And I know this is a topic a lot of people are curious about because in that session, we're going to deal with things like how do you grandparent children whenever your relationship is marked by distance? Um, you have grandchildren who live far away. How can you be intentionally involved in the lives of grandchildren who don't live near you? Another challenge in today's culture is divorce. Fairly regularly, I'm hearing stories of fellow grandparents who are struggling with the effects of their own divorce from an ex-wife, and now the grandkids want to relate to grandma over here and grandpa over there, and they don't even live in the same place. There's a divorce in the older generation. Sometimes there's divorce in the middle generation, and our kids or kids-in-law have custody of the kids, and sometimes there's doors that get slammed. And somebody, maybe a child-in-law, an ex-child-in-law, says, we don't want you influencing our kids with your religion. How are we supposed to respond to that? How does the gospel shape our response in those kinds of situations? Or grandparents that are faced with defiance, either kids or older grandkids who are defiant toward the gospel, defiant toward God. I don't want your religion. I don't want to hear anything about the Bible. Uh, leave me alone. 
how can we as gospel-centered grandparents have an influence on grandkids whenever there's that break in relationship, there's a defiance. We're going to spend an evening talking about those subjects. And then the last session is going to be a very important subject, how do I leave a godly legacy? Just last night, Gladine and I were talking on a, on a phone call about how can we impact our grandkids in a way that they, in turn, will be gospel-centered grandparents in 40 or 50 years. How can we be an impact on our grandkids so that they'll be grandparents someday in a way that honors God and his gospel? How do we leave a godly legacy? We want to talk about that. But this evening, we want to focus on one important question, a foundational question, and, and that is, what does God want us to know about these grandkids of ours? How do we know how to be grandparents? Why don't we start there? How do we know how to be grandparents? Can I just ask you, what has shaped your understanding of grandparenting? And having talked to grandparents in various parts of the United States on this issue, one thing I've discovered is a lot of grandparents shape their grandparenting based on how their grandparents grandparented them. You following my, my logic there? And so they think back, when I was a kid, how did my grandparents relate to me? If that was a positive experience, and some of you have wonderful memories of your grandparents, and you say, I had wonderful grandma, wonderful grandpa, and you think that was so powerful in my life, I want to do that with my grandkids. So your grandparenting has been shaped by your memories of your grandparents. Or maybe it's the flip side of that coin, and you think, you know what? I wasn't close to my grandparents at all. Or maybe it was even a negative influence. You had a grandparent, maybe you didn't follow the Lord, and that relationship was actually painful. And you think, <clears throat> I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be like my grandpa. I'm not going to be like my grandma. I'm going to do it differently. And you're shaping your grandparenting based on the experience you had as a grandchild, either positive or negative. You're reacting. Or to bring it down to one generation closer, maybe you look at how your parents or your parents-in-law grandparented your own kids. And you think, man, I love the way my parents, I love the way my in-laws impacted our kids. I sure want to do that. I want to do that when it's my turn to be a grandparent. I want to grandparent my grandkids the way my parents impacted our kids. Or maybe it was negative, and you think, I'm not doing that. Either way, whether it's your grandparents or your parents, if you're designing your grandparenting based on what you've experienced or witnessed in the oldest generation, your grandparents or your parents, you realize that's just reactionary. You're just being shaped by what you have seen, positively or negatively. And to be frank, <clears throat> because churches in recent years have not done a very good job of teaching the Bible on the subject of grandparenting, a lot of professing Christian grandparents are just assimilating what they see in the culture. And you think of grandparents you know at your workplace or your neighborhood, your social interactions, and you're watching their posts on social media, and you think, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, we ought to do that. Or, why in the world did they do that? We're not doing that. And you're just looking at the culture around you, and that's what's shaping your grandparenting. Friends, we want to do it differently, don't we? We want the Word of God. We want the Bible to positively shape our grandparenting. Now, if you do a word search on the word grandparent, depending on which English translation you're using, I can tell you right now, you're going to get only a few hits. The Bible doesn't use the word grandparenting very often. It does, but infrequently. And you say, well, the Bible then doesn't tell us much about grandparenting. Oh, it does, but you don't want to limit yourself to the word grandparenting. Look for things like, <clears throat> your son and your son's sons. Or one generation shall tell another generation, and you begin to see in the Bible these other ways of expressing intergenerational impact. 
that the older generation is to be impacting the younger generations for God's glory and their good. So you look at that and you find out, no, the Bible does talk about biblical grandparenting. The Bible does talk about gospel-centered grandparenting. We have a friend in the Christian grandparenting movement who said <clears throat> his life changed by reading the word and. The word and. And he told us the rest of that story. He said, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 says this, Make them, the things of God, known to your children and your children's children. That's Deuteronomy 4.9. Make the things of God, the things of God, his, his actions, his character, his teaching, make them known to your sons and to your son's sons, your children and your children's children. And he said when he read that word and, it changed his life. Because up until that point, he thought, we raised our kids, they're adults now, they're starting families of their own, my work's done. I raised my kids, now it's their turn to raise their kids. I'm done. He just kind of assumed I did my role, now it's their turn. It is their turn, but it's not only their turn. And he had this life transformation, radical life transformation, where he not only got involved in his grandkids' lives, but he now is joining us on this quest, we're joining him on this quest of calling other grandparents to grandparent their children in a way that's based on God's word. The power of the word and. <clears throat> the Bible has a lot to teach us about grandparenting, but it also has a lot to teach us about who these grandkids are. Who are these grandkids? You know, we can get so sentimental with our grandkids, can't we? <clears throat> Just today, talking to someone in our neighborhood who's a, a new grandma and a, <laughs> She said, I know I'm prejudiced, but he really is the cutest baby. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with her. You know, maybe he is. <laughs> I didn't do any cuteness meter on him. <laughs> you know, but <clears throat> we get so sentimental. People say things like, oh, my granddaughter, she's a little angel. <laughs> she's a little angel. <clears throat> you know, and, and uh, she's just the cutest little thing. And, and we get so sentimental sometimes about our grandchildren that we form these opinions about them, we, we get this idea of who they are apart from the Word of God. But if we were to develop what I call a biblical anthropology, put those words together, anthropology is the study of man. What do we know about people? What do we know about mankind from the Bible? The Bible teaches us things about us as people, an anthropology. What if we developed a biblical anthropology that we could apply to grandparenting? What if we let the Word of God shape us, shape our thinking about these little ones or these teenagers or even adult grandchildren, that we look at them and we say, according to God's Word, I know this about my grandson. I know this about my granddaughter, not just from what I've experienced seeing his or hers weaknesses and strengths, but what do I know about that grandchild based on the Word of God? Let me just give you three things to think about on that subject of what does the Bible teach us about our grandchildren. One is, and I think you'll find this to be good news, God wants us to know that our grandchildren are his blessing to us and to our kids. Let, let me just be candid here and say that sometimes in our culture, grandchildren are seen as a, at least somewhat of a burden that we're not sure we're ready to carry. You know, having a lot of fun interaction with the grandkids, that, that's okay, but we don't want too much of a good thing now, do we? <laughs> I've heard more than one grandparent say teasingly, I love it when I see those headlights pulling into our driveway, when I know the kids are bringing our grandkids, and I love it when I see the taillights <laughs> as they take those grandkids home, because I'm tired. <laughs> We've been there. I mean, the older we get, the, the lower the energy level is, but it seems like the grandkids, they've not peaked yet, and they're still quite energetic. 
You know, and sometimes we feel like, you know what, I could just use a break from those grandkids. <laughs> and, and we've all felt that at times, that, that we can look at our grandkids and think, to some degree, you know what, they're, they're a bit of a burden. And I think we see this in our culture. When I think about our Western culture here in the 21st century, you, you look at what's happened. And if you love history and you go back and you think, go back in history, maybe let's say 150 years. How did most people live? How did most families live 150 years ago? A huge percentage of people 150 years ago lived on the family farm. And you know what happened to grandpa and grandma as they got older? They lived with the rest of the family. And they'd do what they could, whatever they were able to do physically, they would do on the farm, they would contribute, and, and they were there at the dining room table or the kitchen table, interacting not only with their kids, but their grandkids about life. And life was done intergenerationally, where the older generation was intimately involved in the lives of the coming generations. But since the Industrial Revolution, that has just gradually changed. And at first, there was a, a division, a bifurcation in the generations because dad needed work. You know, maybe the farm wasn't producing enough money, so he went off to the city to work, and grandpa and grandma had to sell the farm or whatever, and, and now the generations are beginning to separate. It was regrettable, but we got to do it. But then you move forward in time a little bit more, and what was regretted in that generation has become acceptable. And so you don't have to go back too many years to find out people are saying, we don't really like it, but you know what? That's the way it is. We can live with it. The separation of the generations. You know what we're seeing in the last 50 years, 40 years? Generational separation is not only acceptable, it's preferable. And so now what do you have? Well, we have these places you can go and, and you can just live with people in your own age bracket. You don't have to have kids around. You don't have to have them around. You can just hang out with people in your own age bracket, spending your golden years doing what you want to do. I mean, let's face it, folks, we've done our time. We raised our kids. It's time now for us to enjoy ourselves. So let's hang out with our peers and spend our days golfing, cruising, shopping, playing shuffleboard. <laughs> Let's spend our day doing things we want to do because we've done our time. In that culture that we're living here in Northern, North America right now, where there is this ideal of separating the generations. And what's happened, sadly, is uh, we have a growing phenomenon in North America that I would call we have a lot of grand orphans. The younger generation having very little interaction with grandpa and grandma. Oh, they might see them at Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever, and, and maybe they get nice packages in the mail or Amazon gets sent their way, you know. So there, it's not that there's no interaction, but it's primarily lighthearted, superficial, and there's not a lot of life-on-life -life stuff going on for the sake of the gospel. But God wants us to know, God wants us to know in his word that children are a blessing to the family. Some well-known verses, Psalm 127, verse 3, children are a heritage from the Lord. In the very next psalm, the psalmist says in Psalm 128, verse 6, may you see your children's children. That was considered a blessing, to live long enough to see your grandchildren, to live long enough to have a relationship with the coming generation, the grandchildren. Or this one, uh, let's own it, older friends, Proverbs 17, 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged. <laughs> you know, you might say, well, I'm not aged, and many of you here are younger than I. And yet, <clears throat> it's okay to get older. It's okay to be aged uh, when we realize the blessing, one of the blessings of being older is that we have grandchildren who are a crown to us. They're a blessing to us. And so we're asking the question, just to back up a step, what we're asking here is, what does the Bible teach us about our grandchildren? How do we shape our understanding of who these young people are? Well, one thing the Bible teaches us is they're a blessing from him. They're his blessing to us. Secondly, God wants us to know that our grandchildren are his creation. <clears throat> I 
like all of us, our grandchildren are the handiwork of God. Now, you probably are wondering why I'm bringing this up. It's, it should be like, well, well, Larry, isn't that so obvious that our grandchildren are the handiwork of God? Yes, but think about the world in which we live. If it's true that God made us, if it's true that God made our grandchildren, what does that tell us regarding dependence? It teaches us that our grandchildren are dependent on God. And so when you think of your grandchild, whether that grandchild's six weeks old or 26 years old, when you think about your grandchildren, to look at your granddaughter, your grandson, and to, and to let the word of God shape your understanding of who he is, who she is, and you look and you say, my grandson, my granddaughter is a creation of God and therefore dependent on him. We live in a culture that deliberately is teaching children, you know, you can be on your own and you can determine your own course in life. And there's this whole idea that you're not dependent. And friends, we are dependent on God, not just for life itself, but for our understanding of life. Where is your grandchild going to get his understanding of what makes life work? Where is your granddaughter going to get an understanding of what's true, of what's moral? We are dependent on God to tell us what's true in life, what's moral, what's immoral. How do things work? What matters? What doesn't matter? All these things are derivative. Our knowledge is derivative. We derive our understanding of life from God. So we get our very life from God, but we also get our definition of life, our, our understanding of what makes life work from God. I remember as a young dad being gripped by this proverb, Proverb 1-7. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. A little bit later, it says the beginning of wisdom. But in 1 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The beginning. That's where you start. You don't say, Well, get your understanding of the world by looking at the world, and then why don't we tack some Bible verses on you, grandson, granddaughter, so that you can have a Christian worldview? That ain't going to work. We have to start with the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about God? Our understanding of God comes from the Bible. Our understanding of us comes from the Bible. Your grandson, your granddaughter's understanding of who they are must come from the Bible. And here we are as grandparents, and we have the awesome privilege of helping shape their understanding of life itself. Our grandchildren, being God's creation, are not only dependent on him, and in my simple way of thinking, I... I picture an arrow coming down from God. I picture an arrow coming down from heaven toward me, toward our grandchildren. And I realize we're dependent on him. But you know what? That arrow goes the other direction too, doesn't it? Because my grandson, my granddaughter is created by God. He, she is also accountable to God. By the way, just an aside here. Have you ever wondered why the doctrine of biblical creation is so passionately designed? denied in our world? Why is the doctrine of creation so passionately denied? Because if it's true, then I'm going to have to give an account to my creator God, and I'll not stand for that. And so there is this defiance of the doctrine of creation in our world, because if it's true, that changes everything. If it's true that God created me, then I will have to give an account to my creator, God. Now that's true for us as the older generation. It's also true for our grandchildren. That when you look at your grandchild and you say, who is this little person? Who is this younger person? A blessing from God, but also a creation of God, dependent on him and accountable to him. And I think that in our current culture, that we're swimming upstream on this one. And you'll hear people say things to kids like, just so you're true to yourself. You just need to be true to yourself. You need to find out what's true for you. Because what's true for you might not be true for me. 
you need to just determine what's right for you and what's wrong for you. And, and there is this deliberate inculcating into the world and life view of young people that you are the ultimate decisioner. You are the one who will decide what's true and what's false, what's right and what's wrong. And the children are being taught to look within, look within and determine what's true, determine what's right, look in, or maybe a little bit different, I might say look around. What does society say is true? What does society say is right and wrong? But as gospel-centered grandparents, we have to look at our grandchildren and lovingly, patiently, regularly, continuously say, don't look within, <laughs> don't look around for trying to figure out truth. Don't look within, don't look around for trying to figure out morality. Look up, look up that you are a creation of God. And because you're a creation of God, you are dependent on him, not only for the breath you breathe, but for his explanation of everything. The fear of the Lord is the beginning, the foundation of knowledge. And not only are you dependent on him, son, grandson, sweetheart, granddaughter, but you are accountable to God. That one day you will stand before the God who made you. And I'm praying that that whole idea brings a smile to your face and a smile to his face. One of the memorable statements in Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 7, God says, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. That we realize that we were made for the glory of God. Your grandson, your granddaughter was made for the glory of God. So we're asking the question again, what does God want me to know about my grandchildren? How can I develop a biblical understanding of humanity, but particularly, how can I understand from the Bible how God made my grandson, how God made my granddaughter? He or she is a blessing from God. He or she is a creation of God. But also, our grandchildren are his image bearers. <laughs> now, you read that right in the first chapter of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God says, Let us make man in our image. Now that tells us something. When you look at your little grandson, your granddaughter, and you say, that grandson of mine, that granddaughter of mine is an image bearer of God. What does that mean? What difference does that make? Well, one thing that teaches us is that our grandchildren can relate to God in a way that no non-human created thing can. So a giraffe, a snail, a tree, a rock, a non-human creation can bring glory to God, but cannot relate to God the way an image bearer can. And so when you think of your grandson, your granddaughter, and you realize God made my grandson, God made my granddaughter to be an image bearer, he made that young person to be in relationship with him, that God wants a relationship with him. You think about the story of the Bible. How, how does the Bible start? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But then we read about God's special creation, human beings, image bearers. And there in the Garden of Eden, we see God dwelling, as it were, with Adam and Eve, that God made these image bearers to be in a special relationship with him. And then sin came. And now there's distance, a broken relationship. The Bible begins in a garden a garden where God is relating in a very special way to his image bearers. How does the Bible end? How does the Bible end? You read Revelation 21, Revelation 22, and Revelation 21, John says, I saw heaven descending to the earth, and I heard a voice. God says, I will make my dwelling with you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And you realize that's the best good thing of all. That's the best good thing, that God wants to come and live with us in a sin-free, curse-free earth forever and ever. That's the heaven of heavens, that God wants to be with us. Everything between Genesis 3 and Revelation 21 is how God is going to get us from there to there. It's the gospel story how God is restoring this relationship with his image bearers. 
And when you think about your grandson, when you think about your granddaughter, you realize God made him, God made her to be in special relationship with him as an image bearer. Now, apart from the intervening grace of God, your grandkids aren't going to get that. They're going to get that maybe through you. But if we don't pour the gospel into them in the Lord's normal providence, they're not going to hear the gospel. They got to hear it somewhere. And so if that's just absent from their thinking, they're going to try to find meaning in life. They're going to try to find happiness in life. They're going to try to find joy in life somewhere else. That we are made as... We're made to be worshipers. We're made to be in relationship with God. And if that's missing, kids and adults, kids will find something else to fill that. And it'll always be disappointing. And so you wonder why so many kids are frustrated, maybe angry, maybe depressed. Well, we have to go back to the beginning. What was he made for? What was she made for? Made for relationship with God. We need to understand that when we deal with our grandkids, especially as they move from being little kids, they start to get a little bit older and interacting more with the world, that we look at them and we say, my grandson, my granddaughter was made to be an image bearer of God, made to be in a relationship with God. And also then to reflect God, that my grandchild has some of the attributes, the transferable attributes, they call them communicable attributes of God. So God is a God who is volitional. God wills, God chooses. You know this from the time your grandchild's months old, that that grandchild has a will of his or her own, don't they? <laughs> no! Have you ever taught your grandchild to say that word? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> it just comes so naturally. <laughs> they're, they're image bearers, they have a will. You know, they, they think. Our grandchildren are thinkers. And as grandparents, we should encourage that. that that's a reflection of, of God, that they're image bearers, and they should be thinkers. Process life with them. Ask them hard questions. The older they get, make them harder questions. You know, They're always wanting our grandchildren to, process, grandchildren to process life. Why is that important? Why is that not? How did you decide that's important and that's not important? How did you decide that he or she would make a good friend for you? Why, why do you think we should not watch that program? Why do you think we ought to stay off those sites? You're always processing. Because this image bearer, who you call grandson, granddaughter, is made in the image of God. And thinks, processes. And also then, our grandchildren are made to represent God. So you have three R words there, don't you? Relate, reflect, represent now, if you tend to call a granddaughter your little princess, you're not far off. <laughs> In actuality, your grandchildren were made to be little princes and princesses under the auspices of the great high king, God himself. He made your grandchildren to be image bearers who were princesses and princesses for his glory. And you realize that when you are helping your kids disciple their kids, when you come along in a support role, to your kids and discipling their kids, your grandchildren, you realize that my grandchildren are to re represent God, that they are to reflect him. I had uh, some days with our grandchildren last summer where we talked about being mirrors. We are mirrors reflecting the glory of God. Oh, there might be dirt on our mirrors and they might be cracked, but we're still mirrors. And there's only one perfect mirror, and that's Jesus Christ the perfect image bearer. He's the exact representation of God. But the Holy Spirit is making us, as we're Christians, he's making us more and more like the perfect mirror. He's making us more and more like Jesus Christ. And you think about that. When you're interacting with your grandkids, you're thinking, God made my grandson. He made my granddaughter to be an image bearer. So how can I be cooperating with the Lord in this whole endeavor to shape my granddaughter, shape my grandson in a way that he or she understands that's who I am. That's how God made me. He made me a blessing to my parents and my grandparents. I'm his creation. I'm dependent on him and accountable to him. And I'm an image bearer. I relate to him. I relate to God. I reflect God and I represent God. There's another thing that we know about our grandkids from the Bible. 
and it's such an important subject, we're going to hold it for the next session, and that is this, that your grandchildren or mine were made not only in the image of God, but made in our image. I was reading in Genesis 5 one time, and I kind of skimmed over a verse, then I went back and reread it. You know, Adam and Eve had kids beyond Cain and Abel. And it says in Genesis 5 that when Seth was born, he was made in the image of God. And then Moses records there that he was also made in the image of his father. What does that mean? Well, little Seth was born a sinner because his dad and mom were sinners. And your grandchildren are sinners and so are mine in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God wants us to know that too. And next session, we want to devote the whole session to that subject of do our grandchildren really need a savior? Why is that? How do we talk to them about their need for Jesus Christ? So as we wrap up here, let's just re remember that our view of grandparenting must come from the word of God. Not just reacting to our parents, our grandparents, the culture around us, but we want the word of God, the Bible, to shape our whole understanding of our calling. What is God's calling on my life as a grandparent? And how does the Word of God shape our understanding of our grandkids? I want you to do some homework, if you will, before session two, and that is this. In the book, Grandparenting with Grace, read through pages 21. So that's not a lot of reading, uh, but I think this week, if you will, please pick up a book and read pages, um, even the front matter, uh, the Roman numeral pages, read up through page 21. And you'll notice at the end of the first chapter and the second chapter, you'll notice some questions, some discussion questions, some action steps. Don't skim over those. If you're reading it with someone else, a spouse or some friends, process that as well. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. You could have left us in the dark, but in your grace, you gave us the living word, your son, Jesus Christ, and you gave us the written word, the Bible, so that we would know you, we would understand you, so that we would know ourselves, and yes, so that we would understand our grandchildren, how you made them, why you made them. Help us on this quest, Lord, to be influenced not only by your word, but your spirit taking your word and applying it to our relationships with our kids and our grandkids in a way that's for your glory and their eternal good. In Jesus' name, amen.